Thanks a lot. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here, to honor Turing. So when Jakob invited me, uh, he also mentioned that my talk should be related to the work of Turing, and I thought uh, in many ways that this was, of course, totally obvious because I do mathematical physics and uh, Turing is one of the pioneers, so whatever I would talk about would be related to the work of Turing. Of course, I could have chosen a subject where the Turing's name was in the title. I could have talked about leap Turing inequalities or other subjects where Turing's name was in the title, but I decided actually to talk about what I did when I was here as a senior research fellow in 2014. Uh, and in fact, this was in the spring of 2014, and we all know that Walter Turing passed away in the in August, just after the summer of 2014. So the work we did when we were here and when Turing was still around was probably some of the last activities that happened at the EASY uh, while Turing was alive. So uh, first of all, I really want to thank EASY for giving us the opportunity. I was here with two PhD students, one PhD student of my own, uh, Robin Reuvers, and a visiting PhD student, Marcin Napierkowski, we spent three months here, and the work I will tell you about simply took off during this period. It was a very intense period. We worked from early in the morning till late in the evening, and we were the only people left at the Schrodinger Institute, and it was just fantastic to have this quiet peace around us. And of course, Turing did come in, not late in the evening, but uh, he did come in occasionally, but we actually never had a chance to totally discuss with him what we were doing because we also didn't quite know at the time exactly what it was that we were doing, but uh, it sort of took form and was shaped, and I'll tell you about it here. And it's certainly in the spirit of the rigorous work that Turing was uh, emphasizing in the, on many-body quantum theory. So we're not really doing many-body quantum theory, we will do an approximation to many-body quantum theory. So let me try to formulate the motivation, we wanted to understand the Bogolyubov approximation. You may notice that through the slides, Bogolyubov will be spelled in several ways because I'm never really sure how to spell it and I forget to consistently go through the slides and correct it. So there's either an I or no I. Anyway, it's always the same Bogolyubov I'm talking about. So I'm trying to formulate the Bogolyubov approximation for both gases as a variational model. And uh, so, so there are d different motivations for the work. One thing is sort of to find general properties of such a formulation, showing that there really are minimizers of this. That's a more mathematical question. But then show that it has the qualitatively correct behavior that you would expect the many-body theory to have. Existence of both Einstein condensation of diagonal long-range order. Uh, I want to get this one. There, maybe superfluidity. This is actually work still in progress. We don't know exactly how to formulate it in this model. But we also wanted to do a quantitative analysis of the dilute limit. So by the dilute limit, I mean when we have a potential with a certain uh, relevant length scale, the scattering length, and we want the scattering length to be much, much shorter than the interparticle, the average interparticle spacing. So rho is the density. So rho one third a is a, is a dimensionless quantity that should be much, much less than one. And in that limit, there are different expectations. So one expectation is that there's an energy asymptotics for the ground state energy of such a Bose gas. And uh, well, also for the free energy at positive temperature. But the very famous asymptotics goes back to Li, Huang, and Yang, the Li, Huang, Yang formula. And I'm writing it here that says that the thermodynamic energy per volume as a function of the density it depends on the density and on the scattering length. This is a remarkable property that to the first leading orders, it depends only on the, I mean, the potential dependence. The energy is only through the scattering length, and the formula is right here. And I'll, uh, I will discuss this formula quite a bit. So that's a, sort of an energy asymptotic, and one would like to see to what extent that follows from this variational approach to the Bogolyubov approximation. And then we would also like to understand the critical temperature asymptotics. I mean, how does the critical temperature, where you go from having a Bose-Einstein condensate to not having one, how does this temperature depend on the interactions? And in particular, can we understand this dependence at very 
uh, low uh, um, density in the dilute in the dilute limit. Right? So, so these are sort of the motivations uh, for the work I will discuss, and I'll go back and tell you what we know now in this model. So let me give you an overview. So let me first uh, tell you a little bit about what's known experimentally. So there, there's what's known experimentally, what is expected theoretically, and what do we actually know rigorously, or what do we know in the different approximations. So those are very different levels of of uh, knowledge. So uh, I, I will discuss experimental tests. I will discuss the critical temperature. Now, the critical temperature, there are actually no experimental tests for the issue I want to discuss. Now, how the critical temperature changes. I mean, there, there are good estimates for the critical temperature, but they're not good enough to tell us how it depends on the scattering length. Uh, there is a lot of theoretical work on this, and Daniel Ulci has made a long list that goes back from 1958 to 2010. So, and I'll, tell you, I'll show you Ulci's list of how, what people have thought about the change in the critical temperature. And then I'll discuss the critical temperature in this variational model. I will review what's known rigorously for the many-body problem, so not just in the approximate model. Then I'll formulate, or I'll remind you, of the Bogolyubov approximation, how one can do a variational formulation of the Bogolyubov approximation that leads to a certain functional, an integral, uh, an energy functional, a free energy functional, and I'll discuss results about it, both general results and then the dilute limit when the interparticle spacing is much longer than the scattering length. And then I'll discuss in this dilute limit, in particular, the Li Huang Yang asymptotics and the critical temperature asymptotics. And I'll give you the exact statement that we have for the critical temperature asymptotics in this formulation, and I'll give you a summary in the end. So the three sort of topics I'd like to discuss is Bose-Einstein condensation. So that I consider to be a general property of our model, that it has the right qualitative picture of the model. So there's both einstein condensation. There is free energy asymptotics. That's what I call the Li Huang Yang asymptotics. That's an example of the asymptotics in the dilute limit. And then there's the critical temperature asymptotics. So there's sort of these three quantitative of, or both quantitative and qualitative aspects that I'd like to sort of focus on along the way. So, it's very well known that uh, in experimental setups, uh, Bose-Einstein condensation was seen in 1995. There's this famous experiment where one looks at the, at the momentum distributions and see what happens as we cool down the gas. That's the uh, rubidium gas. So the effect of Bose-Einstein condensation is well established experimentally, not mathematically, and I'll discuss this in a second. Then there's the energy asymptotics, the Li Huang Yang formula. See, that's also been studied experimentally. Uh, and this is this, uh, this is this picture here. This is a paper by Navong. This is the group in France that have studied uh, lithium gas. And they have seen that there is a correction. So the, the, the thing here is what they call, this is from their paper, this is what they call the mean field. That's the leading order uh, energy correction. And uh, so the, the leading order energy asymptotics, and then you have the curve down here, which is the, uh, which is, are the, the measured points compared to the LHY correction. And we see that it, they have a very, very good fit. In fact, they can even, this famous constant of 128 over 15 square root of pi, they get very, very close experimentally to verifying that constant. Okay. Now, what, what about mathematically? Well, Essentially, nothing is known completely rigorously in mathematical physics um, when it comes to Bose-Einstein condensation. There are only very, very few examples where we actually know Bose-Einstein condensation. So here, I listed sort of in what I would think in order of difficulty uh, what I consider problems in mathematical physics. So the validity of the Bogolyubov approximation, where the LHY formula, the Li Huang Yang formula, is an example, I think that's the thing we are probably closest to being able to establish, although we do not have it completely yet. We have a lot of intermediate results. Then there's the existence of both Einstein condensation for fully thermodynamic systems. I will just talk about thermodynamic systems here. There are a lot of more results for trapped gases, but I will not 
discuss or review them. So establishing both Einstein condensation for thermodynamic systems with general interaction is an open problem. And then, of course, understanding how the critical temperature depends on uh, interactions, well, that we cannot even start posing before we know that there is a critical, uh, that there is a phase transition. So I, this is certainly a more difficult question even than understanding both Einstein condensation. Okay. So let me briefly review this issue of the critical temperature. Right. So for the ideal gas, the critical temperature is uh, it's well known. It depends on the density to the power two thirds. There is some constant. Everything is explicitly known. And it gives, it, it, it's very accurate. So Feynman asked the question, how does the critical temperature change in an interacting gas? And he was in particular asking it for helium. Where for helium, the, this formula is pretty good. But there is a small change, and it's actually negative. And Feynman was a, so, so the critical temperature actually goes down. It, the critical temperature for helium is smaller than it is for the free gas. And, and Feynman was able to explain this by sort of arguing that there was a larger effective mass. Li and Yang then, later in 1958, asked the situation for a dilute system. Now, the, the helium is not the, does not fall into the picture of Li and Yang. And Li and Yang actually makes a prediction for the critical temperature, that the critical temperature goes up compared to the critical temperature of the free gas. So there's a critical temperature uh, for the interacting gas, and we are comparing it to the critical temperature for the free gas. And it's the free gas is the correct leading order term in a dilute limit where rho one third A goes to zero. And Li and Yang actually predict that it should change linearly in the scattering length and that it should go up, contrary to helium where it goes down. But not only that, there's a little appendix in their paper where they even do a quantitative calculation and they get a constant which is 1.79. And so they have this formula for the change of the critical temperature. Here, so the scattering length in their paper, they were doing particularly the, Bose, the hard core, the hard sphere Bose gas. So the scattering length there is simply the radius of the hard core. So, uh, um, this here is, the, uh, is the, sorry, an example of what you would get in helium. Uh, so here's Ulchi's list of what people have discussed on the critical temperature. Now somehow the exact prediction of Li and Yang were, were somehow forgotten. It was remembered that Li and Yang said that it was linear in the scattering length. But the fact that they actually gave a constant, they didn't emphasize this in their paper because I don't think they really believed that it was in any way accurate. So they put it in an appendix and they didn't emphasize it, but they did emphasize the linear dependence on the scattering length. But then you see that over the years, there's been lots of different uh, suggestions. They even were not in the beginning no agreement on the power of the scattering length. Does it go like the square root? Or maybe does it go like three halves? Uh, there's the Feder and Veletska that says it goes down, but again, Feder and Veletska in their book, it's not totally clear that they're actually looking at the dilute limit. So they may actually rather be reproducing Feynman's result. Um, anyway, so there are lots and lots of discussion, but at some point, uh, it's more or less agreed upon that it goes linearly in the scattering length, and the discussion becomes what is the constant there. But at this point, it's sort of forgotten that Li and Yang already made a prediction for that constant, which was 1.79. So there were sort of different suggestions, 4.66. I mean, these are all different calculations. Uh, and it uh, seems to have stabilized now to be sort of around 1.2, 1.3. In fact, uh, Monte Carlo simulations seem to indicate that this constant is 1.3. So we started analyzing this in the Bogolyubov model that we are formulating and arrived at a constant which is 1.49. It's actually not all that different from what Li and Yang did back in 1958, except that they ignored quite a few complicated terms, which corrected a little bit. So we are getting 1.49, and my PhD student, this is a picture he showed for his defense. 
where he put our result in all the different other results that people had had. Some of them are uh, Monte Carlo calculations, some are analytic calculations. This is the Monte Carlo, one point, which is about 1.3. The blue is our calculation, which is 1.49. And then you see the different values of this constant. Li and Yang were actually quite close. If we believe on the 1.3, they had this 1.79. Let me just briefly review what's known rigorously on the Bose gas. So, energy asymptotics. As I said, in order of difficulty, the energy asymptotics, not that I'm claiming it's easy, but it's easier than Bose-Einstein condensation, which is again easier than understanding the critical temperature, and we have fewer and fewer results as we go down. For the energy asymptotics, there's the seminal paper of Lieb and Jakob, where they prove the leading order in the dilute limit. So this is the thing that in my slide on the, on the experiments was called the mean field, although I think in particular Elliot has discussed that this has nothing to do with mean field, but, but that's how it was called in the experimental paper. This is the 4 pi rho squared A leading energy asymptotics at the, at the, um, in the dilute limit. Erdeschlein and Yao then actually found an upper bound, uh, which was again correct to leading order, and gave an error term which was of the order of the Li Huang Yang in the dilute limit. Now, that, this is a, also a very interesting paper that I will discuss in a moment. Yao and Jin actually then proved the Li Huang Yang as an upper bound in the dilute limit. Not for the hardcore gas. See, Li and Ingwersen actually they were able to treat the hardcore gas. Uh, Yao and Yin, they have to assume that the, that the interaction potential is integrable, or has at least some, t some degree of smoothness. The exact, I'm, I'm not totally sure of, but I think integrability may be enough, but I'm not totally sure. So it's certainly still an, uh, uh, an open problem to show the Li Huang Yang upper bound even in the case where you have a hardcore gas. Zairenga and Giuliani then proved the lower bound and this is a little bit funny. I think this may even be in their titles. This is the dilute but high density limit. That's because they say that there are two length scales of this potential. There's the scattering length, but there's also the range of the potential. And they play with those two. They think of the range being much longer than the scattering length. That's a, for a very soft potential, that's possible. And in that limit, so the range is now longer than the interparticle spacing, but the scattering length is much shorter. And in that limit, they are able to establish the Li Huang Yang formula, which is a consequence, uh, emphasized, of the Bogolyubov approximation. And together with Lieb, I studied the Bogolyubov approximation for charged Bose systems. It turns out that that's to some extent easier, and, and we're actually able to prove the, that the Bogolyubov approximation gives the correct uh, energy asymptotics for charge systems, so these are charged bosons, so it's of an academic, there are no charge or stable charged bosons, but we studied them anyway, and we found that Bogolyubov gave the right answer, it was a Coulomb system. And, uh, and our work was to some extent the motivation for the work of Siren and Julian. For both Einstein condensation, Kennedy, Sastry, and Lieb actually showed it for hardcore bosons on a lattice. This is related to the work on the phase transition of the, Heisenberg, the quantum Heisenberg model, the antiferromagnetic quantum Heisenberg model. Um, and then uh, with, uh, there were a lot of people, Eisenman, Lieb, Zeiringer, me, and Jakob. Uh, Zeiringer is Robert. But give all the people in here with first names. Um, we studied the hardcore bosons on an optical lattice. And finally, the critical temperature the only known rigorous result is an upper bound on the critical temperature. I mean, showing that if the temperature is high enough, then you do not have a condensed phase. Uh, and this is Robert with Daniel Ulci. Uh, so they gave this bound where you see it goes like the square root of A, where we expect that the correct asymptotics is linear in A. Okay, so let me give you a, a short introduction to the Bogolyubov approximation. So, we are looking at a Bose gas. I'm reading it here, writing it here in, in a second quantization. We have a box, but we are going to take the thermodynamic limit uh, where the size of the box goes to infinity. 
So the key thing in Bogolyubov's approximation is to say that there is a condensate and that the condensate is into the momentum P equal to zero. Now, it turns out that it's not really necessary that you have a condensate. In fact, the Bogolyubov approximation is also accurate in uh, one and two dimensions in the cases where one can calculate it, where we do not have a strict condensate. So, so, so one has to, so, so actually assuming condensation as a strict property is not really necessary for the Bogolyubov approximation. And that's also why we may have a chance to show the accuracy of the Bogolyubov approximation without actually establishing condensation. Okay, but what Bogolyubov says is that since we have condensation into the momentum zero state, we can think of the creation and annihilation operators for momentum zero as a C number as being the square root of the number of particles. Almost all the particles are in here. A0 may add or subtract the particle, but that's no difference, so we just replace it by the uh, square root of n. All the other creation and annihilation operators we think of as being rather small. So the terms that have four creation and annihilation operators that are all non-zero, if they are non-zero, we just ignore that term. Or if there are three non-zero, I mean, if if the creation, the, if, the, if within this quartic term there are three terms, there's only one which is with a zero, then we also ignore that. That's the, these are the three sort of steps in Bogolyubov's approximation to replace A0 by a C number and to remove all terms above the quadratic terms in the remaining creation and annihilation of. And then you are left with an operator that looks like this. So an operator that's quadratic in creation, an annihilation operator, and that couples momentum P. Well, I mean, there's a P with itself, of course, but it, otherwise it couples momentum P to momentum minus P. So it's a quadratic Hamiltonian. It's not particle number conserving any longer. The original Hamiltonian was particle number conserving. There's an equal number of creation and annihilation operators in each term. Down here, because I've replaced A0 by root n, here I have terms that create particles or terms that annihilate particles. But the way you should think about it is that you have this condensate, which is like a huge resource of particles, and you can take particles in and out of that resource. So when you treat all the, inter all the excited particles, they're not conserved. They can fall into the condensate and be pulled out of the condensate. The important thing about the quadratic Hamiltonian is that it can be diagonalized exactly. Right? So Bogolyubov could calculate the energy for this. And he could find the excitation spectrum of the excited particles, and that led Landau to give his criterion on superfluidity. That's a very long story. We want to turn things around because we want to say, okay, this Hamiltonian, you can do changes to the Hamiltonian and arrive at a quadratic Hamiltonian, which is then minimized by quasi-free states. So the minimum of this Hamiltonian here is a quasi-free state. Also, the temperature states of a quadratic Hamiltonian are also quasi-free. So we are turning things around and say, we look at the original Hamiltonian, but we restrict to the states that would be the ones that are correct if we believe in the Bogolyubov approximation. So that's the way we're turning it into a variational model. We are not changing the Hamiltonian, we are restricting the states. This is analogous to what's done in atomic physics when you look at the Hartree-Fock theory. Then you restrict the many-body Hamiltonian to Slater determinants. Slater determinants are the states that describe the free fermions, and you consider free fermion states their expectation value for, atomic, uh, for the full atomic Hamilton. So we're doing the same. And when we restrict to quasi-free states, we can calculate the for the creation and annihilation of the quartic term using Wick's theorem. Right? So that means we split everything in terms of the four-point function that is expressed from the two-point function. So everything in the quasi-free state is expressed in terms of two-point function. No? So we make, to, to analyze the system we're looking at, which is a translation invariant system, we make a further uh, assumption that, uh, that the only 
terms that come in here are the A dagger PAP and the APA minus P. For the, for the, so this is the term, this is the uh, expectation value that's related to the particle non-conserving part, and this is sort of the direct part of the state. So we assume we have a state that's expressed only in terms of those two. Now, when I talk about quasi-free states, it's sometimes a little unclear whether you expect what, what you do with linear expectation values. I mean, exact definition, whether that's included in what it means to be a quasi-free state. But we certainly want to be able to treat the condensate. So the way we do it is we say, okay, we replace, instead of doing a C number substitution, we say we do a unitary transformation of our Hamiltonian where we replace the annihilation or creation operators by uh, a new one where the zero momentum uh, annihilation operator has been shifted. That's just the unitary transformation. And then in this new, for these new variables, we take expectation value in quasi-free states where we set the first order, I mean the one-point function to be zero. So that means the whole state is described from the gamma, which is the AP dagger AP, that describes the density of particles and momentum P. We have the rho naught, the thing that's written here, that's the shift we've made of the zero momentum annihilation operator. That the rho naught is the condensation, so that's an indication of Bose-Einstein condensation in our formulation, not in the many-body theory, but in this formulation. And if this alpha is non-zero, alpha was the particle non-conserving expectation value, then that would indicate the off-diagonal long-range order. Although it's not in any way proving off-diagonal long-range order in the many-body theory, but in our variational formulation, it, uh, it's the sign of it. Okay, so what, what do we end up with? So we have now this state and we are taking an expectation value of the original Hamiltonian, we don't change it in that state. Everything is expressed in terms of the gamma, which tells you the occupation numbers in the, in the different momentum sectors. There's the alpha, which is the pairing, and then there's the condensation, which is rho naught. Now, there's some, these are not just completely arbitrary, the gamma has to be a non-negative function, it has to be integrable, both the kinetic energy and it, uh, the integral of gamma is the number of excited particles, and if you're integrating against p squared, you're getting the total kinetic energy of the excited particles. So you need gamma to be integrable in that. There is a condition that comes from the fact that these are quasi-free state, that the pairing function is not totally independent from the, from the direct function, from the occupation. Alpha squared has to be less than or equal to gamma times gamma plus one. And then, of course, uh, either you have condensation or you don't. Rho naught is a non-negative uh, non number. So when you take the expectation value, and here I'm actually doing the expectation value for the free energy. So I'm doing the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, but I'm also taking out the entropy. I'm including the entropy in this so that I'm actually looking at the free energy of this state. And I'll come to the entropy in a second, but let me just run through the terms real fast. So, so there's the kinetic energy of the excited particles, or in fact all the particles, for the, because the, 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 uh, the, the condensate particles have no kinetic energy. Then there is, if you want, the mean field interaction between all the particles. That's the density squared times the integral of the potential that I'm writing as the Fourier transform of V. I'm, writing, I'm doing this in a grand canonical formulation, so I'm putting in a chemical potential. Then there's the entropy. I'll get back to that in a second. Then you have the terms that Bogolyubov would also have. These are the terms coming from the quadratic part that you would have gotten if you had done the C number substitution. These are the terms that have an A dagger PAP expectation, that's the gamma, or a pairing expectation, that's the alpha. So this term here is what Bogolyubov would have. But then we have two additional terms that come from the, the other terms in Wicks when we apply Wicks rule. Uh, there's the gamma interacting with gamma and the alpha with the alpha. So these are the more difficult terms to treat mathematically and it will turn out that they are actually important also quantitatively when we get to the dilute limit. It is, we do not get the right answer if we ignore these two terms. 
Now, the entropy of a quasi-free state can be rather easily calculated. They're, they're expressed in terms of this quantity here, gamma plus a half squared minus alpha squared. And you can see that this, that's already related to this assumption up there. This is positive if we have this assumption here. And then the entropy is the usual free gas entropy of a, uh, of a state, but when you, where you're using this instead of just the gamma. If it, was, if, if, it had been a, um, if it had been alpha equal to zero, then you might recognize this formula as the usual formula for a free Bose gas. Okay, so what are the general results that we can prove? So we can actually show that there are minimizers for this Hamiltonian. That's somewhat difficult because of these, uh, the, the convolution terms. And we can show that there is a phase diagram that shows Bose-Einstein condensation. So there is a critical temperature so that the rho naught is non-zero if you're below it or above it. I should be a little careful. We don't quite, I mean, on this picture here, I've there's a little shaded region here. We don't know that as we increase the temperature that the transition happens at what temperature. We just know that there is sort of a little range here so that when we are below it, we have condensation, and when we are above it, we do not have condensation. And then this is the answer to your question, Jakob, that the, the, the alpha is non-zero in this model if and only if the rho naught is non-zero. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of discussions, but mainly in lower temperatures, uh, so lower dimensions, I think, in, in, in dimension two, where we expect alpha to be non-zero when rho naught is zero. But, but the Bogolyubov approximation would not show this, because it's, I think what people usually have in mind is that there's a quasi-condensate. And uh, so, so in some sense, morally, you should think this as rather quasi-condensate. And then you would have if and only if there. But of course, in two dimensions, we know that there's no real Bose, there's no Bose-Einstein condensation on really macroscopic uh, length scales. Now, uh, uh, similar phase uh, diagrams have been shown for similar models. There's a series of works by Bru and Zagrebnov. Li and Yang, of course, also studied it. And Popov has lots of, uh, has written a whole book where he has studied things. But they all ignore the quadratic, I mean, the, 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 the convolution terms. Okay, so let me try to argue that the, that the convolution terms are in fact important, and I'll do that when I go to the dilute limit. So we want to analyze this uh, row one third A. And there are two things I have in mind when I say I want to analyze this uh, quantitatively. I would like to try to establish the Li-Huang-Yang expansion, and I would like to try to understand the critical term. So, it, it's really difficult to analyze because of the quadratic, uh, the, the convolution terms that, that come from the quadratic term. But it turns out that we can actually approximate those. There's a way of approximating it. And if you do the analysis carefully, so, so that's what I'm sort of schematically just trying to say here, we want to write, we're doing this in the canonical formulation. So we're fixing the density and we're trying to minimize over gamma, alpha, and rho naught. Gamma was the uh, occupation numbers of the excited particles, the pairing, and the, the, um, the condensate uh, density. And we have the rho naught plus the rho gamma, so the particles in the condensate plus the particles, the excited particles, together give the full density. Right? So these are the densities of the, two, of the two parts of the gas, the condensate part and the excited particles part. So that's the canonical formulation. And what we show is that we can approximate this by what we call the simplified functional, in which we actually get rid of the convolution terms. Not to say that the convolution terms are unimportant, but we can linearize them. There's a way of linearizing these terms uh, and, and being able to treat them not as non-local terms, but as local terms. And that turns out to be rather important. Because this simplified functional, the, 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 the variation in the gamma and alpha, the minimization in gamma and alpha can be done explicitly. The answer is different from what you would get if you did it only for the, for the part that Bogolyubov looked at or Li and Yang looked at. I mean, when you do not have the quadratic terms. Yeah. And in fact, how is it different? 
Well, the, the, it turns out that the part where you want to minimize it looks very much like what you had for the, for the, um, for the, the usual Bogol Yubov, if I go back and show you. This was what I said, this was the Bogol Yubov term, the rho naught with the potential, and then we had the gamma plus alpha. It turns out that that's essentially what you should look at, except that the potential has to be replaced by a different object. It has to be replaced by VW hat, where W is the scattering solution. So the scattering solution does come in when you want to study, uh, when you want to study the, um, the minimization in gamma and alpha. And that's interesting because Bogolyubov, in his original paper when he studied the uh, uh, where he introduced this, he did not get the right answer. He did not get the scattering length. He actually got the integral of v. And there's a little footnote where he refers to Landau that's telling him that, that that's wrong. You should think of the integral of v as being the leading term in the Born series for the scattering length, and you should simply replace it by the scattering length. Now, if, you keep, if one keeps the quartic terms, and does the analysis carefully, then the scattering length actually comes in. Not to say that I'm getting the scattering length everywhere where I would like to get it. There's a whole issue of when is integral v, when is it integral v, the first term in the scattering length, or when is it the scattering length. It should be when we study the Li Huang Yang formula, we study the energy asymptotic, we expect it to depend only on the scattering length. We are not getting that, but we're getting it to leading order. And in fact, this was noticed in a paper by Erdos Schlein Yao that I referred to early on, that you get actually the scattering length coming in. Okay, so, so this is now easy to analyze because it's essentially the same as what Bogolyubov analyzed. It's more complicated because this function here is not, uh, one, this is sort of given more Im implicitly. Anyway, so what do we get for the Li Huang Yang as asymptotics? So, I was, as I said, we're looking at the canonical free energy. We're minimizing, so, so that simply means that I set the chemical potential to be zero. I remove the term with the chemical potential, but instead I fix the total density. The rho gamma is the same as the integral of gamma, the sum of all the occupation numbers, plus the density, that's the total number of particles. I don't know the distribution between the two. I mean, how many excited, how many condensate particles do I have, how many excited particles do I have, that's part of the solution I have to find. But I minimize the free energy over all the combinations. And then we arrive at an asymptotics for this, for this uh, functional, I mean, not for the many-body problem, which says that in the dilute limit, and if you have sufficiently low temperature, and this is more or less what Erdos, Schlein, and Yao had noticed already, although they do not exactly minimize this functional, but they use similar trial states, at least for t equal to zero. But we show that in the dilute limit, and if the temperature is small enough, there's a relevant length scale here, right? The, there's the, the temperature scale, and this, this scale here, the rho a, is related to the length scale in the, in the Bogolyubov pairs. So the, the square root of, uh, of uh, rho a is uh, one over the distance between the, the pairs in Bogolyubov theory. Okay, so then let me come to the uh, critical temperature uh, asymptotics. So that's in a different regime of temperatures. Now we go from the low temperature where we did the Li Huang Yang, now we go up to the critical, close to the critical temperature. Right? And, and there, the, the, the condensate would be rather small, right? because we, we, we want to understand what happens when condensation disappears to find the critical temperature. So rho naught will actually be rather small. It turns out that when you start studying these, you are doing expansions very close to the critical temperature. So, so uh, the, lim the square root Ta, T is like rho two-thirds. So... Uh, all the way again. Uh, t, uh, t is like an energy, so it's one over a length squared, so it's rho to the two thirds. So, so this, so, so square root of t becomes rho to the one third, and rho one third a is then much less than one. That's the dilute limit. Right. 
It turns out that in order to understand the critical temperature, how does, how does things, what is the variation we get when we vary the density in the condensate right around zero to the sort of correct order turns out to be T squared A and the energy changes to the order T4 to the AQ. This is something one has to do the calculation and check that that's how things are. And it turns out that the canonical energy is this and then to something which is lower order. So we will understand the energy to this order, t to the 4 aq, to try to understand the critical temperature. And then one has to analyze this function here. f as a function of k and sigma, one has re rescaled everything, so the relevant parameter is how does the condensate density change on the scale t squared a, and how does the density vary from the free critical density to some, so the k is something that measures the density, and the sigma is something that measures the ratio which is condensate, in the condensate. And this function here is an explicit function of k and sigma. It turns out that you can do all these integrals that come out of the explicit minimization of the simplified function I discussed before. So this is uh, an explicit function. It's not very simple, but it's explicit. It's square roots and polynomial. It's, it's square root of rational functions. And then we simply plot it for different values of k as a function of sigma. Right? We want to know whether it's minimized for sigma being zero or for sigma being positive. Sigma being positive means we have condensation. Sigma mean, being zero means we do not have condensation. And here I've just showed it. I mean, that, that, one has, that, that minimization one has to do numerically because it's a sort of complicated function, right? but explicit. So we've shown it here for k being 1.2, 1.28, and 1.35. Just to show 1.28 is exactly the point where you go from... Not, so at this value here, sigma clearly wants to be positive. That's at k being 1.2. Remember, k was a density parameter. If k is 1.35 then it's better to um, not have a condensate, to have sigma equal to zero. Here it's better to have sigma non-zero, and we then vary to find exactly the point where the minimum happens at a different value, or where you have the, the turnover from having a positive sigma to sigma being zero. And the reason we can actually say exactly when this happens is that it's not that, this, that, 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 it, that the function goes down here, it's actually that sigma jumps from being zero to being something positive. That's physically not quite reasonable. It's, uh, it's um, it, a sign of a first order phase transition. The phase transition is expected to be second order. It's nice for us because then we can analyze it mathematically and say it happens exactly at this point, 1.28. So this is how the density depends on temperature. I formulated it before the other way around. Uh, temperature depending on density, but that's just turning, turning this equation here around. Here I made a picture of the energy as a function of density. This is the k parameter down here. Right? k being 1.28 is exactly this point. Right? So this is where you go from having no condensation. So this is the part where there's no condensation, and here there is condensation. And you can see that the density as a function of rho is not a convex function. So that's, of course, a problem with this, this nonlinear approximation that we are looking at. Right? But this 1.28 is then our approximation to the critical temperature, so the exact statement is here. Again, we have the problem of the difference between integral v and 8 pi a. So when I said before that we got the constant 1.49 in front of the rho one third a, that's only in the limit where one can replace integral v by the scattering length. Right? So when this thing here is 1, then this function goes to 1.4, to 1.49. So that, but that's, and it, that's a rigorous statement in this Bogolyubov variational formulation. We are not saying that there's a fixed critical temperature. We're just saying that when t is bigger than something which has this expansion with some error, or t is less than something with the same expansion and some error, then we have either condensation or no condensation. So let me summarize. So the model we looked at, it comes from doing Bogolyubov theory in a different way than what Bogolyubov did, or what has been done traditionally, which has been to change the Hamiltonian. We restrict to a special class of states, 
And in this sense, it's the analog of the Hartree-Fox theory for atoms. It has a qualitatively correct phase diagram with Bose-Einstein condensation. And it reproduces the leading order energy in the dilute limit. I mean, the 4 pi rho squared A is correct. And it has the LHY correction if integral V is of order 8 pi A. And we obtain an expression for the critical temperature in the dilute limit. We don't have a physically exactly correct picture in the sense that it's a first order phase transition. But this rather simple model where you can do an exact analysis and exactly calculate the critical temperature reproduces the linear behavior in the scattering length when you change as, as a function of how the critical temperature depends on the potential. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.